Welcome to the May 2022 episode of law.mit.edu's idea flow, where this month we're going to go deep into governance, the sort of how to do it and how not to do it in a decentralized world with our very own Wasim Al Sindi, who is the technology editor for the MIT Computational Law Report. Um, the, but, uh, the, the premier publication of law.mit.edu. And this is not just a topic that's near and dear to our hearts, and mine in particular, I've come out of legal governance um, for especially multi-party systems, uh, but it's also very much uh, a sort of brick that we're building in a new structure for the publication on the very notion of composable governance uh, that's being spearheaded by our editor-in-chief, Brian Wilson, who thank goodness is with us and is going to be helping to host this conversation and also mute people as needed and things like that. And so without further ado, I would like to I would like to invite you, Wasim, to come off mute and to introduce yourself and then if you will, to give us uh, a little bit of an overview of what you're going to say so people kind of are in tune with the topic. And, uh, and, and as we discussed earlier, we're going to structure this, uh, this program as more of a conversation. Um, and so, uh, and, and just the final thing I'll say in prep is what I hope will come out of it in addition to learning and sharing information is, is to start to highlight what some of the misadventures, to use your language, have been in governance in this in this new decentralized uh, space, and and especially what we might learn from this that can perhaps even serve as an input of some kind or a, or, or a um, a design requirement of something to get right, a type of a capability or a process or a method or a mechanism for governance. So. Um, so with, with all that said and done, uh, Wasim, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks very much, Dazza. Hey, everybody. Yeah, it was uh, always good to be here. Um, this time, uh, I'm in control. Um, and so, yeah, it's uh, it was all a bit last minute um, putting this together. Um, so it's uh, I don't really have like a cohesive uh, presentation for you. So I've just thrown together um, some slides and like I wrote a little provocation, which I, I think we shared in advance. Um, so let me just um, share my screen and we can have a look at some of that. Um, this one, that, hopefully you can see Looks that. Great. great. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, the, the topic for today, well, let me just find that over there. Yes, I've got you over there, great. Yeah, so topic for today, and we're talking about um, you know, so that we're here for, uh, on the auspices on the aegis of the MIT computational law report. And I suppose I'm the technology editor normally here, and I know very little about the law, almost nothing. Um, but I suppose uh, uh, some familiarity with the governance of uh, technical systems, especially headless peer to peer decentralized ones, um, gives us an indication of uh, where the computational law might be going in the future. And so uh, today I've just taken like a particular slice through this like um, rich, complex, messy topic of, you know, uh, crypto governance, especially to do with like blockchain cryptocurrencies. And um, we're going to talk about um, where it all began, which is Bitcoin. Um, and uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I, it's not a very structured uh, thing. But what I did was I put together um, a couple of, where is it? Let me get through to the next slide. Oh, let me, yeah, here are the, here are the provocations or the questions that I want us to, to ponder and consider uh, uh, through this. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, uh, Daza, uh, Brian, and everyone else here uh, can, uh, can help us do that. You know, we can all do that together. So here's some questions for us to ask ourselves uh, as we go through uh, the journey. And so the first one is, you know, uh, well, first of all, I'll say that the, um, the the subtitle here is the price of Bitcoin's anarchy. And I think like actually anarchy is quite a good way of thinking about Bitcoin, uh, kind of no gods, no rulers. Um, there are some rules though, the network imposes, the protocol imposes rules. Uh, but like in terms of, um, you know, 
uh, prescribing or proscribing how uh, one entity should behave uh, with regards to another, there is pretty much nothing else. And, you know, in some ways, that's, uh, you know, a lot of people that like Bitcoin use it, see that as a boon. And I think a lot of other people see that as a headache or, you know, worse. Um, so here's some things for us to ponder. Yeah. Uh, how does today's reality, yeah, where we are with Bitcoin in 2022, line up with the enduring narrative imaginary of Bitcoin as a tool for empowerment, inclusion, and fairness? Uh, how do decisions get made in a headless community without any formal governance structures? Uh, there are clear tensions between uh, the drive towards protocol ossification, the idea that we can kind of reach a final specification of Bitcoin that doesn't change, and forward progress ideals to keep improving the technology. Uh, which one wins out? Uh, can Bitcoin still be thought of as an experiment when nation states are formally adopting and integrating it into their societies? Uh, can such an illegal monetary asset endure under a hostile regulatory environment? And, you know, I guess the ultimate question with all of this, um, especially as we loop back to, you know, the law, uh, the law part of computational law, uh, to what extent can the law meaningfully impact Bitcoin? And so, like, I've got some materials which address some of these things in tangentially or directly. And uh, uh, for other ones, like, I'm hoping we can just have a bit more of an open uh, discussion. Uh, so I'm just going to kind of go through some like, um, yeah, some bits and pieces. And uh, hopefully we can, um, yeah, explore some of these things. But before I do that, I should just say a little bit um, about myself. Uh, so like, you know, just to say a bit about how I got here. Uh, so I was originally a, a scientist. So I've got um, several uh, degrees in physics and chemistry. Um, and uh, you can see a bunch of stuff from my PhD uh, on the left column there uh, doing uh, photo ultra fast photophysics of uh, supramolecular assemblies uh, so that in that what that translates to is using lasers to do very fast photography in the different parts of the light spectrum um, and so yeah that sounds very far away from the law and it is um, and parallel to that i was also had a kind of creative practice you know, art music kind of stuff um, that uh, took off in my late 20s after I finished my PhD. So I went off and traveled the world, did music and art stuff for quite a while. And while I was doing that, uh, well, actually, while I was in the in the Bay Area uh, on tour in 2013, I um, went to visit a friend who was doing an internship at Intel. And he opened his closet and said, check this out. I'm doing this thing called mining Bitcoin. And so that was my entry into this uh, into this world. And I just, you know, I was very curious at that point. Uh, he was pretty negative about it, I'll be honest. Uh, he was... Um, uh, very down on Bitcoin because it was costing a lot of electricity to do this mining back then. Bitcoin wasn't worth very much. It was just a science project, really. Um, so, yeah, my first introduction to it was actually quite a negative one. Um, but uh, because of my background, like, so my family's from Iraq, from the Middle East, and uh, they had a lot of political and economic problems there. And so the idea of a natively digital censorship resistant, tamper evident, you know, uh, coercion resistant, uh, I mean, natively digital means of value transfer that immediately spoke to me. And so, yeah, I just went down this rabbit hole uh, over the years. Uh, and that, um, you know, took me through to being an independent researcher, writing papers, you know, data science, philosophy, and so on. And then, uh, and then I showed up in a place called Boston, Massachusetts uh, in 2019, uh, where I uh, got a job to uh, set up and co-found um, the MIT Media Labs blockchain journal, which is called Crypto Economic Systems. And so we also did a conference series. So prior to the pandemic, we did a couple of conferences and we were really built, trying to build this big tent um, where we're trying to bring people from all of the fields together. So from cryptography, from art, from law, economics, uh, philosophy, uh, everywhere, economics, uh, computer science and theory, of course. And so we were trying to build the field by bring, you know, doing this kind of big tent work. And um, I think that might be one of the reasons why I'm here, because while we were doing this journal, I got to spend a lot of time with uh, people uh, like legal academics and legal minds, policy people. And uh, I didn't expect it, but they were the ones that I got on with best. Like I thought I'd maybe get on a bit more with the kind of STEM science and computer science, science types, given my background. Uh, but I got really well with the, the more law, law types. And I, just before I went to MIT, I was also working on a, a regulatory epistemology project called Token Space, which I'm not going to talk about uh, today. Uh, but I was trying to build um, uh, representations uh, that could help uh, disentangle the similarities and differences of the, as of the characteristics of tokens and, and assets and networks. Anyway, um, this is the thing that I do now. So I'm in Berlin 
and uh, we have this uh, kind of a collective which is kind of engaged in uh, art, philosophy, uh, theory, um, and uh, other forms of interrogating digital culture. Uh, we write, uh, you know, we write, we do research, we um, produce art, and so on. We're currently funded by the uh, European Union and Ars Electronica uh, under their Starts Fellowship Program, and we're currently writing uh, play, theatrical production, and a computer game about uh, Bitcoin and its impact on the climate, which is something that we're going to touch on in a moment. Uh, and so we use this notion of the price of anarchy uh, at the top, like, you know, in the subtitle of the, of the blurb of the talk. I just wanted to elaborate a bit on that because I think it's also a very interesting concept uh, to think about uh, more generally. And it's something we've discussed in the, in the salon uh, here in Berlin quite recently. So the, I, this idea of the price of anarchy comes from uh, economics and game theory, where you're essentially trying to kind of squash down and formalize in a mathematical kind of closed form sense, uh, ways that you can compare the, the, you know, the performance, the efficiency of uh, different um, uh, organizational topologies. So you could think of this as packets of data going around networks, but you can also invoke these same kinds of contexts uh, for, for human organizing, mutual aid, solidarity organizations on the left, and so on. So basically what you're trying to do here is understand the tension between uh, horizontality and verticality. When I say horizontality, I mean this kind of peer-to-peer-ness, this decentralization-ness that you see this kind of drive, at least kind of an ideological drive towards in the crypto space uh, versus this kind of top-down command control cybernetic uh, uh, or, or, you know, command and control or cybernetic uh, type um, uh, structures, which we know are efficient because we've been using those forever. Um, but then we lose something there in terms of agency as individuals underneath those uh, bureaucracies. Um, so yeah, so the price of anarchy is an interesting conceptual lens to think about the um, these differences in efficiencies and the tensions between these um, uh, competing goals or ideals. And so yeah, that was our um, set of provocations, which we just came to. I thought we could um, run through them a little bit uh, one by one. And, uh, you know, when we come back to these, this kind of master slide, you know, Dazza and Brian, uh, also feel free to, to, to jump in. Um, like if you might have questions or provocations, which you can, which you can elaborate on a bit more. Uh, I've also got little stuff in the, uh, stuff in the trunk if we go quiet. <laughs> I mean, one, I, I see Brian came off mute. So, uh, I encourage you to, um, to pipe up and just, um, consider this like a living room conversation of the type that we sometimes yeah. all have together. Uh, but I want to, I do want to just throw one thing out. That's almost a framing question. Um, just to be at least, uh, just to get it out, out onto the table, which is, it's and it came out a little bit with your previous slide looking at um i guess command and control approaches versus a self-organizing emergent who knows what you'd call the what the theory of change would be uh for for totally decentralized systems uh and it is and it's just that which is um it, 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 is there a decent truly decentralized system that even exists um for about which to dis governance, you know, should be talked about or could be talked about in any practical, non-completely theoretical way, or, or is it, or, or is it really that we've got systems that have, you know, aspects or maybe aspirations toward decentralization, but in reality are implemented and deployed in ways that have, um, you know, clusters of um, command and control or, you know, takeover even in ways that are maybe just below the surface or, or even reflected within the architecture itself. Um, and uh, and then I guess part of that is just to be just to confirm um, ordinarily um, those of you who have like hung out in law.mit.edu, especially it's like prior incarnations before the computational law report know that we have had a pronounced um, uh, preference toward like um, the boring side of the spectrum and like looking at exciting technologies, but in otherwise completely mundane and, you know, centuries old in some cases, organizational forms. Uh, and, and this is different. And so like very much in scope, finally, for everybody that's always wanted this, now is the day on this topic of composable governance where it's okay to talk about completely decentralized systems and new forms of business and social relationships and things that are, you know, arguably don't exist today. But I guess I want to throw out there, like, number one, is there such a thing? And, and number two, is the scope of this talk, should we say 
that what our benchmark is, is we're looking at what would a truly decentralized system look like and how do these governance approaches, you know, um, you know, succeed or fail um, against that. And, and if so, like, why? I guess I just also throw out there, like, why are we talking about a completely decentralized system? Like, did somebody wake up someday to say that's the goal? And if so, like, uh, what were the reasons for that? Yeah, I think um, decentralization is really helpful to think of whatever you think decentralization is or means like uh, the way a helpful th way to think about it is as a kind of a, a, a poetic ideal or a goal. Like it's a thing that we feel like it's virtuous and we're driving towards. And when you think of it like that it explains a lot of the behavior in the in the crypto space because you always hear people say, Oh, we started off centralized, but we're going to be decentralized. Progressive decentralization is the goal sufficiently decentralized as uh, Hinman said in 2018. Uh, so de decentralized equals good, right? I think we've, you know, that, that seems to be at least the implication in the discourse. Um, but I think what, what really trying to get at in this talk, especially because we're talking about extremely inefficient system, like uh, Bit with the name of Bitcoin, um, is that, the, and we're using this framing of the price of anarchy to say that, you know, um, in some senses, ideologically speaking, decentralization is this kind of goal where people think it's good, but it comes at there are prices to pay for it. One of the prices is in this kind of notion of efficiency. If we talk about uh, digital networks, where they're obviously just passing messages between nodes, like whatever they're doing, that essentially boils down to that, um, then uh, you can measure these things. You can kind of, kind of characterize and measure these things in quite, a, you know, or at least, um, you know, talk about them in quite a formal sense. Um, and so decentralization is messy. Decentralization is inefficient. And, you know, it takes a lot more messages or it takes a lot more um, uh, communication, time to reach consensus on things when there is no authority. I think we all know that uh, because, like, there's always situations in even in the hierarchical world that we, you know, like, you know, the institutions that we inhabit, there are little parts of those which are a bit anarchic. Like, I don't know, the coffee room is sometimes a place of like anarchy, right? Where the rules don't seem to uh, work in the same way or be enforced in the same way. Um, and so like, you know, in those kinds of situations where there, there tends to be a lack of authority, we start to see, you know, entropy or chaos start to build up. And so like, it, it's, na it's natural for us to, I think, then see, you know, um, realizations that doing certain parts of processes, you know, organizational processes in a top-down way or in a regimented way, would lead to more efficiency. And in the Salon conversation on this topic uh, earlier this week, uh, somebody mentioned, um, it was a, I think it was um, a socialist worker cooperative and they um, were, were organizing in, in as an anarchic way as possible, except for their voting and decision-making for the actual kind of like whatever, the gears of governance, where they had this very fast cadence of votes um, because they know that they knew that that, that would otherwise be that kind of decision paralysis uh, from being from that kind of radical inclusiveness um, that uh, a flat structure necessitates. Um, so I think, you know, and somebody also said in the conversation last week, and I can't remember who it was, um, that there's no decentralization without centralization. That, you know, these two things are kind of not exist, they exist with each other. They're kind of yin and yang in a way. Um, and so you kind of can't really have uh, one without the other. Um, so I think, you know, we see like, why people like to talk about decentralization uh, as a good thing. Um, but then like, it's just the kind of the baggage and the costs that, that come with that. And they can be born in many different, yeah, many different ways. Yeah, and so looking at the question that Chris posed, I think a good example of how this inefficiency plays out from the you know, more decentralized context if you look at what Ethereum is trying to do with implementing Ethereum 2.0, you know, that's taken forever. Like if they were just an authoritarian kind of, uh, you know, top down, we're going to make it this way, you know, it could have been, I think, a lot faster than the two or three years that it's taken to, uh, to get it going. Um, you know, who knows how long it'll take, but, you know, going like trying to answer the question about uh, inclusivity and fairness in Bitcoin, if you think about like what, just the, the shortest answer, I think the price of anarchy is chaos. Um, and I think that is best represented by the fact that if Bitcoin works, like if Bitcoin becomes this thing that's so widely used, 
that uh, you know all of these countries are using it, everybody's using it, everybody's mining it, everybody's devoting their resources to confirm the validity of the transactions. Um, and this is something that you pointed out in one of the previous salons with Seam. It, like we wind up in a place with thermo uh, thermodynamic entropy that's at such a high level that you know it's unsustainable for life on Earth. Um, and so I think that's kind of what I'm always coming back to now is like looking at the incentive trade-off of like, okay, what is the positive of going fully decentralized? Is it worth the cost of like saying, okay, we get all of these network effects, we get, you know, the uh, certainty, the transactional certainty in some cases, but is what we're giving up in the form of, you know, the uh, sort of institutional knowledge, the indigenous knowledge of what's been built up in these analog states over time, are, is it worth losing that? And I think that's sort of the trade-off question. Yeah, I think you've framed it in a really nice way. And this is also the way I tried to frame it as well, because obviously topic like Bitcoin is really divisive. And so people, the conversation can get really polarized if you're not careful. So I actually try really hard not to make any moral arguments. I'm trying never to say orange coin good, orange coin bad, because it's reason X, Y, Z. Instead, I try to frame it in terms of costs and benefits, which I think is exactly what you're doing, Brian. And like, so we know about the benefits, you know, we've talked about well, some, well, at least some of those benefits. Actually, if I, may, I don't think we, I mean, maybe okay. I assume that you do know, which is partly why I asked you to, to say this. I mean, like, I, the, the ones that I, the ones that I, so I think I actually I can show you some slides. When I, yeah, show the slide, because just to yeah. just to put it into context, when yeah. I asked what what is the purpose of decentralization, what are we going for? You sort of said, well, you know, it's thought to be virtuous, which is a good yeah. start, but can we unpack that? And yeah, that, that's the narrative you, side. Yeah, that's that's the kind of like the, the theory side. But I guess like, you know, then we let's let's, let's do some practice. And I think there's also some, ask a question for a little bit of practice in the chat. It's not exactly what was asked for in the chat, but it's something. Um, so this is a pre-MIT project I was working on between 2017 and 19, that I call Reaching Everyone. And I guess these days you might think of it as a decolonial Bitcoin practice project. So I was interested in trying to find ways to help uh, people that are like under dire economic and political circumstances. Um, and you know, so I think things like Bitcoin shine most when the, the um, the, the infrastructures that we rely on, our kind of existing financial and, and governmental uh, social infrastructures, when they're steady, when those institutions are steady, Bitcoin is maybe not needed that much. Uh, but when they're faltering, then that, that might be a place where Bitcoin can shine. And I've seen people talk about Bitcoin as a money of last resort or as a, an asset of last resort. And this is kind of what I was getting at in this project. I don't want to uh, kind of labor the point too much. I wrote some articles for In The Mesh uh, as well uh, on these topics. So we did this kind of like design thinking journey of a migrant, for like leaving the mountains and you know wherever they live, going over a uh, you know, sea in a dinghy, uh, uh, you know, and then uh, being trafficked somewhere, taken somewhere. And in the you know, various stages of that journey, their lives are in other people's hands. And so you could have everything taken away from you in those uh, circumstances, including your life. Um, and so we were trying to think about ways that we could um, slightly alter the um, trust model of Bitcoin, which is basically trust nobody, um, to make it this a bit more usable. And we were trying to think of ways that we could connect uh, the, what might happen is you have a family in one place and one of the members of the family will leave in search of a better life or for whatever reason. Um, and so a way to keep those people connected in kind of like a trust bubble. Um, and so, yeah, we came up with this kind of dual token system with a kind of like a passphrase. Um, and so this thing could be with a, a modified brain wallet. So you could then reconstruct this password using the name of the river in your village, the name of the mountain uh, above your town and so on, your dog's name. Um, so you could use this kind of like, or, you know, like a regional specific knowledge or, or um, situated knowledge. And, um, and yeah, so this is like, we were trying to really do this, uh, but then the problem was, the transactions got really expensive on Bitcoin and got, so it went from like 10 cents, 50 cents, a dollar, $2 to $30, $40, $50. And then that is pricing out. That is like blockchain gentrification in a way that's pricing out less financial use cases and, you know, little alley in the mountains of Afghanistan. Um, and now the transactions are very cheap again, or they got a lot cheaper again, but it's more, the problem is more actually the variability here. Like, cause you're just kind of like selectively pricing people out as the wave like the wave behind me uh, 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 loops up and down. 
Um, and so, yeah, so I saw I saw a lot of uh, benefits here that we could use um, Bitcoin as this kind of, you know, um, really defensive financial tool uh, to help people that are in really desperate situations. Um, but because of the, you know, the evolution of the space, first it was this kind of uncertainty around the block size. And now we see just kind of like rampant financialization uh, all over the, the crypto space. Um, I don't quite see the same emancipatory and, you know, liberation. Yeah, and so, wait, I, actually, I may just, but, but just to make sure I've got this. Um, so the two benefits, if you will, are, um, uh, what would I call it? Like in a trade-off when you're doing, is it worth the cost? You have to be able to articulate what you're going for and then put some kind of unit of value and then do the equation if it was worth it. So the two things I've heard you say so far are number one, it, it can help um, prevent um, a um, kind of a, uh, um, uh, a seizing of assets by a central regime, um, you know, like in, in wartime or when the regime goes bad, some sort of expropriation that's centralized. Uh, and then number two, um, when when you're vulnerable and a refugee or something like that, or, or just in any circumstances, it can provide a capability for individuals to prove ownership of an asset um, in, in, a, in a way that doesn't depend on like a house of cards that can come apart in extreme circumstances like warfare and natural disaster or uh, or um, corrupt government. It, or yeah, I think you've got, two, I think so you got the two. Yeah, towards the end, I think you hit on the two strongest ones. So the, the third bullet point on this list of narrative evolutions of Bitcoin is extreme ownership. And that's kind of getting at this this, this point that, that, that uh, you, you're, you're speaking of. Um, and so, yeah, the, the thing that you own that can't be taken away from you. So it's kind of like, um, you know, this is like a new horizon of property rights. Here, possession is 10 tenths of the of the code is law. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think you I think you're hitting upon it there. But that's the benefits. Right. And so on the cost side, there's like, you know, the, my you know, personal journey has been like watching the, the costs pile up and the benefits not as crew as, as quickly. And ultimately, those are subjective value judgments that one has to make. Um, but I see the kind of ecological end game for Bitcoin as the biggest, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the final battle, final boss in this particular uh, scenario. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I had interrupted you, Brian, just to oh. make sure I understood what the benefits were. Yeah, no, I, I think... Uh... An example that I've been thinking about a lot lately with this, I think, question that people try and oversimplify a lot, which is like, is it is it good or is it bad? I think it's really context dependent. And as an example of that, it's like, you know, you think about Bitcoin with the con like with various conflicts. So like the, in the conflict between Ukraine and Russia you know, Bitcoin can be seen as good because it does, you know, it gets people the ability to transact, but Bitcoin can also be bad because it gets, uh, you know, bad actors a way to legitimize or, or receive, um, you know, financial compensation. And so I think Elizabeth Renaris had a really good article on how Bitcoin might actually threaten um, human rights and, has been in conversations on Twitter a lot with people who, you know, think that it's this really great thing all the time. And I think she makes some really good points that a lot of the space doesn't really know about or doesn't really consider. And so I think that expansion of the dialogue to be much more broad than um, the kind of like, oh, yes, it is good or, oh, no, it's, you know, bad. I think that is an important grounding context there. The, one of the realities is you can't stop people from using it. Yeah. So you can't choose who uses it. So I remember I wrote an article about stable coins in 2019, which I've been uh, uh, dredging up again recently in light of uh, recent market events. And in there, I've, uh, the lead, uh, the main image was um, a screenshot from a newspaper which said, uh, ISIS treasury decimated as Bitcoin collapses. <laughs> so like ISIS was keeping its money in Bitcoin because they can't get a bank account either, right? Um, and so like, you don't get to choose who uses it. So, you know, it's Elon Musk and it's ISIS. Like you don't get to choose. Um, that's again, another problem. And I think uh, uh, Elizabeth is also, you know, hinting at these tensions in the article. Yeah, the currency of enemies. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, I think it's, um, it, but then the, the thing is that that also then speaks to this, um, like a very conservative kind of libertarian cultural imaginary that goes around, yeah. especially Bitcoin. But I think it, it really casts its shadow over the whole space still uh, really, really quite a lot.
Um, and so that's, you know, that's also something to, to bear in mind. I had a slide that I wanted to jump to. I'm just trying to remember where it is. Um, yes, I think the, the ultimate point is that Bitcoin doesn't care. It yeah. does not care, cannot care. It doesn't have any, like, minimal sensing capabilities. Uh, even something like Ethereum with this kind of, like, you know, Turing compete ability um, for arbitrary computation has this, like, sense capability a little bit more than Bitcoin. But Bitcoin really can't, doesn't care about what happens outside it, just wants your uh, energy. That's really, that's really it. Yeah. And so I think it fits with the kind of right-wing ideologies and like people, uh, Colombia has been writing about this for t almost 10 years by now. So this kind of like link of this kind of techno libertarian streak to right-wing uh, thinking and yeah. the Austrian economics has been pretty clearly um, expounded. And it's worth remembering that half of all the Bitcoins that were ever, will ever be created were dished out uh, between 2009 and 2013, uh, like 10 and a half million of the 21 million coins yeah. went out then. And, like, and it went to early adopters who were mostly leaning right, mostly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, that too gets to another weird uh, kind of point, which is around like that uh, variability of the price fluctuations um, in Bitcoin. And I, I just found out about this, so I might be late to the game here, but do you know about the Bitcoin rainbow chart? Oh, is this, wait, I think I know, I think I know what you mean. Is this a price prediction thing? Uh, it it nice. sort of tracks everything on this log scale based on, you know, the, the oh, time uh, yes. between the yeah, halvings. Yeah. And uh, it's really, it's really interesting. Um, certainly not what I would consider to be like, investment advice but it's a it's definitely an interesting context for understanding how these price fluctuations sort of spike and i think one of, key thing to know one thing key thing to know because you'll sort of see like on the rainbow chart that brian's uh, uh linked is that the cycle seems to go every four or so years yeah and that coincides with a very key parameter in the bitcoin network which is called the subsidy halving so every every coin every uh, block in, the, in every page in the ledger of the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, there is a set of coins in there as the reward to the miner for doing all the work or the you know, group of miners that did that. And that reward halves on a deterministic schedule every four years, it's called the halving. Um, and that thing is kind of the ratchet effect of the ratchet of Bitcoin scarcity effect. And so I think it's not, a, it's not an accident that you see this kind of four year cadence on this, on this chart as the scarcity ratchets up. Yeah, and, and I was talking with somebody who was explaining that a, a big driver for this is the, and this ties back into the thermodynamic entropy and chaos of, uh, which is the price of anarchy, which is uh, that the, the cost benefit analysis of, is it efficient to mine Bitcoin based on the electricity costs in my area, that kind of continues to go up and down based on um, you know, what the availability um, uh, of uh, what the av available number of blocks to mine between now and the next halving is. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of uh, ties into what I think this slide is going to talk about with thermoeconomics. Yeah, I mean, like, so proof of work, Bitcoin mining is the engine. It's the engine of Bitcoin and you know, Ethereum. So it's, you know, it's really the kind of the beating heart of these cryptocurrencies. And um, like, you know, I don't want to um, spend too long elaborating on uh, how the mining works, uh, but essentially it's like a lottery where each time somebody does one of these cycles of computation, one of these hashes, it's like a lottery ticket. And if you find a winning lottery ticket, um, then it turns into a game of bingo as you're telling all the different nodes in the network, hey, I found a block, um, this, is, this is valid. And then if the network agrees that your block is valid and then adds it to the, you know, we reach consensus, we add the block and we start again. Um, and so the bribe, the subsidy that we mentioned earlier is the reason, the motivation, the incentive for all the miners to do all of this stuff. And they also get transaction fees as well. You know, uh, a bribe that uh, the users send to the miner uh, to include those transactions as a priority in the next block. Um, and so, yeah, this is actually kind of like a very, I suppose, um, uh, conceptually simple system when you think about it like it's a lottery and then it's a it's a race 
Um, but it has all of these kind of unintended uh, consequences. And that's what just like Brian was starting to allude uh, to. And I'm sure like there's nobody on the call that hasn't heard about or read about an article about the energy consumption of proof of work cryptocurrencies uh, by now. Uh, it seems to be a very hot topic. Um, but uh, what I will say is that um, the, the, the the key for me is like, uh, we meant, uh, uh, though we didn't mention it, I should mention it. There's this thing, uh, the one um, piece of feedback, the one piece of feedback that Bitcoin is capable of is called the difficulty adjustment algorithm. So the difficulty is related to the probability of each one of these cycles of mining finding a block, just like the probability of the lottery ticket being a winning one. And that is adjusted up and down every two weeks, every 1,440 blocks, uh, depending on if the hash rate the amount of total amount of computational power going into finding blocks on the network has scaled up or down. So this thing is just constantly readjusting the probabilities of the lottery tickets being winners, uh, so that the blocks come at a steady pace and the uh, and the the clock keeps ticking. But the, the the consequence of that, and this is kind of like the crux of the book I'm writing about proof of work, is that Bitcoin will then know no satiety. Like the, there will never be enough energy to save Bitcoin. It would always want more energy and it would just keep on recalibrating and adjusting. And uh, it's for that reason that I call Bitcoin an inhuman monetary system. I mean, like, it may, I mean, the monetary part is actually arguable, I think. We can decide, we, we can uh, debate whether we think it's a good money or not. I personally don't think it's a great one right now. Um, but because of this, like, lack of ability of the network to sense outside of its environs, uh, it doesn't, it can't differentiate the kinds of energy you give it. It just wants energy, which means the people that are incentivized to, to do the mining, to supply Bitcoin with energy, they just look for the cheapest energy wherever they can find it. And that involves them traveling all over the world, uh, doing all kinds of um, crazy things. And in the moment that we're in, this kind of ecological moment, and we can all see it, we can all see these IPCC reports uh, these days, um, we see the record temperatures in Antarctica. Um, there is a, yeah, there is a kind of a, I don't want to use the word tipping point uh, without, um, you know, putting air quotes around it because uh, not a lot of people like it. But Bitcoin could be like a marginal factor in the crisis that we have on our planet. And that's kind of a, the crux of, of my argument. And uh, his meme to illustrate that, uh, which is like, you know, we're all being promised financial growth, perpetual financial growth, exponential financial growth. Uh, but the, you know, these systems are connected to the material realities of the world through proof of work. And the world is finite, matter is finite, uh, books finite, and all the rest of it. And so uh, here's really, like, I love showing this to people. This is the hash rate. It's not the price, it's the hash rate. So this is the uh, indirect measurement of the computational resource going into the network. You can see at the start of the chart on the left, there's nothing. That's not even the start of Bitcoin. That's halfway through Bitcoin's life. That's 2015. Uh, so it was even, you know, it was way lower than that before. So you can see this thing is like, you know, now and now actually this is this is old it's gone it's gone way it's back to all-time highs now so it's actually above here now uh, and so uh yeah and these pictures you might have seen pictures like this of mining farms getting flooded burning down and the reasons for this is the miners do crazy things to go to these energy sources these kind of like ultimate uh you know value energy sources they might go to uh, places with hydropower in flood seasons and then they're facilities get rained out or they might go to deserts and plug into like there's you know i saw stories of people plugging in bitcoin miners directly to oil wells you know like well, oil well <laughs> combustion jet engine bitcoin mine i mean literally directly okay. um you now have um i think i have a slide somewhere oh, the thermo economic slide i showed earlier um let me just go back to that for a moment that is um bitcoin a6 inside uh, shipping containers with diesel combustion with combustion engines burning f uh, uh, natural gas from stranded fracking wells uh, in the Permian Basin in the US and Canada. And so that is methane that would normally go in the atmosphere or get burnt to CO2 and not used. So in a perverse sense, that might actually be helping. This might be ne net positive in a crazy way. But the problem is then this allows for corporate greenwashing. So now Exxon is doing this and they're like, this is carbon positive. We're saving the planet and i'm like no this is means you can do more fracking that's not good. yeah yeah if you go two slides forward there about the you know at the cost of uh yep yeah, back one um you know the i think an interesting analogy uh or an interesting kind of isomorphic example is you know the only thing that has exponential growth and 
or one of the only things that has exponential growth in nature is cancer and it kills off the host. And so if you think about Bitcoin as this, you know, this driver of exponential growth, I, it's a scary, uh, it's a scary parallel. And uh, I hope it's not the cancer of the earth. Uh, Brian, do you know the game Universal Paperclips? Have you come across no. that? Oh, I'll have to uh, post a link for you. I, I, before I do that, I apologize for um, wrecking your productivity for a few days. So I'm going to just post this thing. <laughs> yeah. And I like that's with the disclaimer, it's going in the Zoom chat. And the, uh, Vitalik, uh, the founder of Ethereum, co-founder of Ethereum posted this. And so um, this is kind of the, the tech example of that, of the kind okay. of you know, all-consuming cancer. Um, but this is like a paperclip optimizer. So you start off very innocently. You're just kind of clicking a button, making paperclips. And then you get tools to make paperclips. And then all of a sudden you're a hyper dimensional, intelligent AI uh, harvesting <laughs> all the matter in the universe to, to make paperclips. Um, and so that's the logical endpoint of that. And that's kind of like Bitcoin. And just a total aside on the art project we're working on, which is a, a theater production about Bitcoin boiling the oceans. We've taken, you know, Clippy, the Microsoft Office paperclip, yeah. that little annoying anthropomorphized avatar we've made an analog of clippy of uh, of clippy out of uh, bitcoin asic bitcoin mining machine it's called hashing oh, nice. it's the it's the the, the avatar the, the greenwashing apologist of the of the bitcoin miners do you want to see a picture of that yeah but i think that sounds like a yeah. very interesting and then um, after that could you round us back there's so much to talk about with governance uh i think you know um Extermination of the planet is a real good start for a challenge, but could you also <laughs> sort of round it out to some of the more traditional governance issues like that are, um, you know, posed by uh, some of the examples like the Dow hub disaster resulting in a fork, a hard fork of Ethereum, uh, which arguably was at least in part a governance issue there in terms of how, how, to, how decision making occurred uh, to make sure security and decision making for how to who decided how to address the problem and to fork and all of that uh, would every back to the oligarchy there or or, or the, you, you mentioned something about the um, control nodes and and the takeover with the dash system yeah there's, there's so much as I mean like uh, how many how many days have we got to talk about this um, yeah so like uh, I don't know where I don't know where to start these are all topics I'll be covering in my misadventures in crypto governance column at the MIT computational law report. Uh, so I'll just try to give you like really whistle stop tour of those, I guess, between uh, now and the end. This is Hashi on the screen, by the way, oh. the, um, the apologist for uh, Thermo Capital. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, this is us kind of like taking a wry, like stab at a possible future of Bitcoin, where the miners are just trying to like kind of sigh up the, the, um, the planet into letting us keep them running. Um, so yeah, let's, um, I'm going to come off the screen share and we're just going to riff, I guess, on the rest of the stuff, uh, for the rest of the time. I think that's good. That would be um, great. For, for those of you who haven't seen it at law.mit.edu, we've got, um, regular columns now among the, by the editors so that we're producing some of the content as well as, uh, publishing your content. Um, and one of those is, uh, Wasim's columns, which is, uh, misadventures in governance and. Uh, we I linked to the first one um, in the episode page, which you should certainly read, but there's going to be a lot more to come. And yeah, if you could give us a little preview of that, that would be amazing. Sure. I mean, like, so it's like a potted history of like, you know, I guess how to and how not to do things, but it's mostly how not to at the moment, I'll be honest. Um, but yeah, so, okay. So Bitcoin was the first chapter, which we talked about a little bit today, and there isn't really any governance. And that's why it kind of happens in kind of smoke filled committees, like it happens in uh, GitHub, it's about the control of upgrade rights to GitHub repositories, pretty much. So there's this improvement process, all of these conversations happening, like a Linux mailing list on Twitter, places like that. And then like, you know, if you have enough of the Bitcoin personalities behind your thing, you might get it through. That's kind of how it works. It's kind of like a very informal reputation system, which is very liable to, um, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, it's not great. It's not formalized and it's not great. Um, and it's going to be very hard to change that because Bitcoin doesn't really have any way of, it's very hard to put anything inside it. And the blockchains don't pivot, they fork, right? And so when there's a multiple, so you have this new kind of mechanism of secession of schism with, with, with uh, blockchains, which makes it very easy for a group of people that decide they want to do something different. They just change the rules of what they think is acceptable to a block, to a transaction, whatever, and they're off, they're running their own network. And so uh, there was in the years of um, 
Yeah, 17, 16, 17, 18, there were a few kind of uh, interesting things that happened in the in the world of crypto um, that, uh, yeah, used this kind of like fork-based, it's like scorched earth governance. It's a really extreme way of doing doing things. And uh, so in um, 2016, uh, not long after Ethereum launched, there was this project called The DAO, which I, I guess probably most people in the law world have probably heard about by now. It was meant to be a kind of decentralized investment fund. A huge amount of the Ethereum that existed at that time went into it. And um, there were some warnings about like sloppily written contracts, because obviously like and back then we all thought code was law. We actually thought we could do, really do code as law. And so that the, this DAO was made in mind with code as law. Like they genuinely believed that at the time. And um, uh, people pointed out, actually there's problems with the code. Before you deploy this, please check the code. Uh, Emin Goodsire and uh, colleagues wrote something in Hacking Distributed, which is still online. And um, so the thing went live and then somebody found a way to drain the funds from it. Uh, and so then there was this big conversation in the Ethereum space about like, what do we do? The person, could, the, the, the hacker couldn't access the funds for 30 days. It was kind of like time locked. So there was this period of time to decide what, what would happen. And there was this um, carbon vote, which is kind of, um, uh, yeah, like a token holders vote. Like if you have 10 tokens, you have 10 votes. If you have a thousand tokens, you have a thousand votes. And they did a carbon vote very quickly. Um, and uh, the result was like, let's do a fork, take away the hacked funds from the bad people and, uh, uh, and like, you know, delete that. And then like, like it never happened kind of thing. Now, some people didn't like that because they thought code was law. They really thought it, not like when something bad happened, no law is law, code is not law. Uh, other people were like, no, we actually think code is law. And they carried on, on the original path of Ethereum, um, where the bad person kept all the money. And like they, but they, the rules were uh, respected and that's Ethereum classic. So that still exists to this day. And I got very interested in the, like the diverging histories of these two or the diverging futures of these two networks. And so I, um, yeah, I started writing papers. I have this paper series called Forkonomy from uh, 2018 and 19. And uh, the people from Ethereum classic read it. And then I went to speak in South Korea at their conference. And I kind of predicted all the things that were going to go wrong with their network. And then they happened. Uh, like they got 51% attacked. They got gas token arbitraged. Um, they got mining pool centralized. Yeah. It, so they're, they're all these kind of like sad things of being like a little, the kid, the kid sibling of the big, the big uh, dog. Um, you kind of get a bit crushed in the, in the, you know, in the wake of, of that uh, in terms of um, if there's a lot of mining power out there, and your network's very small compared to the, the big one, it takes only a small player to come over and completely mess your stuff up over here. And so we saw that quite a lot. At one point, um, and I know this because I was depositing tokens myself, uh, so the exchanges wanted so many confirmations. They wanted you to like send your transaction and wait for so long to be sure that the, the network wasn't going to get attacked, um, that it took weeks for you to deposit something on an exchange of Ethereum Classic for it to be confirmed, for them to think it's safe enough to not be uh, reorganized. So think to yourself, like, you know, you've got $20 in your pocket, um, and like that money would not be as good if there was a 15% chance next time you put your hands in there, that it wasn't there anymore. Like, you know, this, you know, how can you build a solid, reliable anything if, um, if history is going to get rewritten from uh, underneath you? Um, and so, yeah, that was a bit on the ETH, ETC side and indeed yeah it's good that you're posting stuff about the DAO attacker because people think they know who it is now they didn't know for years but there's now some oh, some ID. I didn't know uh, there's some, oh no there's yeah it's, uh, that, that, I thought that's what you're posting somebody id a potential uh, 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 attacker yeah I'm not sure of the I'm name, gonna actually. I'm gonna do some background searching so that was the it's Ethereum uh, situation. Dash was really interesting. Saying, it doesn't go without saying, if I may, uh, that one of the issues here got, cuts directly to the supposed benefits that we identified, which is extreme. What do you get? Extreme ownership. Nobody can get between you and your stuff. Oh, and the only way to implement this that we know of is with exchanges where people can freeze your funds for 30 days, where people can make you wait 15 days, where people could theoretically expropriate your funds if you're on a sanctions list or on and on and on or for arbitrary and capricious reasons so let's just keep track of the benefits and and how they map to the implementation as well yeah well i think like um there's kind of two games here there's like kind of the game of like playing with the tokens on the exchanges like speculating on somebody else's website and you may as well be holding stocks at that point on a brokerage like you know you're not holding the coins and there's like you know you run a node or a wallet and you've got the coins you self-custody them 
and that's the kind of the extreme ownership but i think like when you've got your coins on a, a, a custody um a service uh, th they're just entries on a database in their wallet really so like you don't really yeah, you don't really own those yep so one of the things i hope we take away from this by the way is uh especially in the composable governance um work brian and everybody uh is um, the, a big distinction and implementation between um, non-custodial versus custodial wallets and what it means for an individual to create a key pair and to utilize that pair that they have exclusive control, the private key of that pair that they have exclusive control over to exercise their rights uh, and to yeah. um, have control over the property as well. But also Let's also rights, say something about like rights, for example. Yeah. Let's also say something about social recovery because I think this is an interesting new model that's being tried out in in the Bitcoin in the uh, Web three space and now a bit more in the Bitcoin yeah. space. The idea that you so normally you have like your whatever your public key, your private key, your username, your password. They might be crunched down into a seed phrase, like some human readable words you can yeah. use as a pseudo password. But social recovery is really interesting because say you lose access yourself, but you can nominate some people that you do trust. And they can help you. They can each have a fragment of your key and help you recover uh, your thing. I think that's a nice model for, for the crypto world, because honestly, even people like, you know, I'm an expert in this space for 10 years. I'm still terrified every time I use, I use this stuff and make a transaction. I gave some coins to my younger brother. He's got two degrees from Cambridge, thinks he's smarter than me. He lost them. He lost them immediately. Uh, so like it, it happens to everyone. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure at this point, more value has been lost, uh, more value has, has been uh, burned by people losing access to their wallets than ever like hacks and attacks and robberies. Way more, way more. Yeah. yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, one example that is kind of interesting that has sparked some debate from like the last week or so was um, Seth Green, the actor, had like lost his uh, board ape that he had built up this entire TV show around. And there are lots of weird IP questions of can they continue the show because, you know, he doesn't have possession and therefore doesn't have the ip rights associated with it anymore or you know what do they as, do I, as i understand brian because I, I spoke about this in an art history lecture i gave yesterday believe it or not oh nice um, and um he's currently negotiating with the person that bought his ape from the scammer yeah so it's now it's now been like it's stolen goods that have been handled and now some yeah. innocent person has got them. And so then like, you know, this idea of possession and rights and, and ownership and access, that it seems to be this massively gray area around all of this stuff, and not least NFTs, is really coming to the to the fore again. And there's another great example, which was Spice Dow. If you remember the Dune yeah. uh, comic book, that got yeah. bought at 100x the reserve for, for price June, by this yeah. Dow, they thought that they could make a movie because they bought that book. Oh, and then yeah. like, you know, people were like, this is a book. This is not rights to anything. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, there's this massively gray area over all this stuff. And you, you all, everyone else on this call knows way more about that than I do. I'm just seeing these kind of tensions come up from the crypto space. People really, you know, come, come out of this space very naively thinking that they have a series of rights and affordances that they, they don't, or they just disappear in smoke. Like uh, happened to this actor. He was halfway yeah. through making a TV show. He's making a TV series with his eight. There's there's a there's an interesting I I posted it's the most recent link in the chat but um, these lawyers for uh, somebody called or a Web three law firm called the Anti Firm talked about really the need for <clears throat> new types of intellectual property rights within the context of NFTs I I mean there's been this sort of development where with CryptoPunks Larva Labs had like the parent company of the NFT uh, issue or, or the NFT issuer retained all of the rights. And then uh, Bored Apes got like very popular because they gave all the rights away and attached them to the NFT itself. And I think there's going to be a third kind of trend where, uh, you know, the rights go to specific people for specific circumstances with regards to the NFT. And it's kind of funny because it feels like everybody's really high on, you know, the decentralization aspect of a lot of this, but a lot of the biggest innovations are sort of coming back to, you know, the old models that we've had for a long time. I think as evidence of that, you know, the mo that article that Gwen, Glenn Weil and uh, Vitalik and um, Pooja Olhaver, I don't know how to say her last name, um, 
put out a week or two ago about soul bound tokens mm. uh you know it it's really like a, it's like tokens that you can't spend or like can't tran like non-transferable tokens it's like you know that's really just like a basic identity credential and we've had those for a while like it's, it's not really a new innovation it's just like so what happens if i lose access to my soul yeah that's well you know i mean have you made a deal with the devil uh i guess is what that, but you know and this really does get back to some of the primitives uh yeah. in terms of law and so like and as you, as you sort of suggested wasim there is a rich heritage in in every legal system for dealing with stolen goods and so if you look at, even at the uniform commercial code a thief of someone's property cannot transfer rights to the property that they did not have in the first place. And so then that raises questions of you would expect if that was a rule that was mirrored in a decentralized system that upon um, an adjudication of some kind or some determination that this was stolen and the ape, the buyer of the ape wasn't the rightful holder, maybe they can be made right, but the original you know, uh, owner, is it, it reverts them, which raises the question, who decides whether something was rightful or wrongfully done? Where's just on this topic, Daz, before we're about to break, I just noticed something today happened that I thought we should mention, which is that Consensus, the large Ethereum venture studio, has partnered with uh, this thing called Asset Reality to do um, recovery of assets for people to get scammed uh, through using misusing uh, wallets like MetaMask. Mm -hmm. So there are already starting to be some kind of like, I don't know, quasi-legal uh, yeah. methods of recourse, uh, uh, maybe joining up the old legal world to the new one. Right. Or, or to make, or yeah, to joining up or, or, or learning from the old one and refactoring it for a decentralized world so that we have capabilities, but they're maybe met in new ways. Like if you have a jury that's listening to evidence and making a determination and deciding, for example, that a board ape belongs to the original owner or not, we could say that that is a type of governance capability. It's people listening, deciding, debating, making a decision, and we move forward. So I think this idea of how to govern and what are the methods and mechanisms of governance uh, is, is really critical to this whole thing. There's so much more that we should talk about. Um, I, I, w I wish that we had gotten to the Dash Masternode takeover um, and what it looks like with cartels. And Let's save takeover. that for the, um, the MIT workshop. I'm saying yeah. Yes. Um, so um, here's some good news, everybody. Uh, on June 29th, we're getting the band back together at MIT and uh, the um, editors for the MIT Computational Law Report are gonna be convening to get a bit of a work session done, but, but we are planning to open some of that up um, and to talk about composable governance. So stand by, if you're, if you're in this um, episode, then you're, you're also on the idea flow list um, and, we, and we will send out information about that uh, where we can get into it further. Moreover, if you're interested in these topics and anything that's been said today has sparked a question or a comment or a new idea, perhaps, in your head, then you should really um, go to law.mit.edu forward slash composable governance and learn more about the special issue that's coming up um, and, and submit your ideas, um, which could be in a written form uh, or they could be in a rich media form. It could be a, a, a prototype of technology that you've done. Um, and uh, Brian is leading the charge on that. So you can reach out to Brian Wilson, who's available at the uh, website. And uh, Wasim is going to be, I hope, um, taking a big role uh, in the Composable Governance special release uh, to come later this year. But with all that said, I just want to thank you so much, Wasim, for, for coming forward and sharing some of your, your perspectives and the background and your, your wisdom uh, with respect to misadventures in governance. And, and, uh, and I, I hope that you will come back to another idea flow as well as these other things so that we can just um, com get further in, in revealing some, some of these um, examples and almost case studies of what's happened so far with governance and what we can learn from it in the design and architecture and the build out and the measurement of, of systems of governance for decentralized world uh, that maybe would work a little better. So thank you very much for coming. Yeah, thanks Daza, thanks Brian, thanks everybody. Uh, it's always great yeah. to be here. And uh, yeah, I'm always happy to come back and uh, share ideas with you as long as, as, long as we all have ideas to, to share and to, to flow around. There we go. Okay, so see you next month on Idea Flow. <laughs>